faithfulness. Faithfulness is a rare trait these days. You struggle with a class, you drop it. You don't like something about your college, you transfer. You get mad at your boss, you quit. You don't like your spouse, you file for divorce. Faithfulness is a rare trait these days. And part of the reason we celebrate 40 years with the same company or 50 years of marriage is <clears throat> because faithfulness surprises us. It actually stands out. It is the exception, not the norm. Yet in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul has faithfulness listed as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see, the word faithfulness could be described like this. Faithfulness is the essence of Christian obedience. It's reflecting a lifestyle that has accepted God's grace. Paul um, expresses how our behavior, our lifestyle, shows an acceptance of God's salvation activity through the person of Jesus. He expresses that the only correct response for to Christ's sacrifice on the cross is our faithfulness. So that's why, that's the why, that's the motive behind being faithful. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God, that you are a God of complete integrity, 100% trustworthy in every regard. And we need your help because we're not. We fail. We're not always faithful. But I trust those who are a part of this video, like me, want to improve, want to be better in our faithfulness and all the fruit of the Spirit. We want to be known as followers of Jesus, and we want to grow into his likeness. And I pray that you'll bless your word this morning as it's preached that we might take a step closer to being um, considered faithful. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your life-changing truth and all of your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our motivation for living a faithful life, a life of faithfulness, of producing an abundant crop of the fruit of faithfulness is because of God's love for us. We love because he first loved us, John writes in 1 John. You see, if you think back to those two charts we've talked about a few times, the position versus, or in addition to the condition chart, our position is outside of Christ, we are lost. But when we come to Christ, we surrender to Christ, we're 100% Christian. We're not 75% Christian, 30% Christian, 99% Christian. We are saved for eternity. But our condition varies because we're all at different points in this journey to Christ's likeness. That's our spiritual condition. Remember, God's intention for us is not just to save us for heaven, but in the meantime, to shape us and mold us into the likeness of Christ and reflecting faithfulness, having the fruit of faithfulness in our life is part of becoming like Jesus. And so we don't obey, we don't strive for faithfulness to earn God's love or to merit our salvation. We can't make God love us any more than he already does. He's not going to love us any less. We're not going to be more deserving or earn our salvation. But we, because we are saved, 100% belonging to Christ, we live lives walking in the Spirit, stepping into the Spirit, as Paul talks about in Galatians 5.16, that we might be faithful to. Now today we're going to look at a man in the Old Testament who is a great example of uh, faithfulness to us. He was faithful even when he was alone. Now, I think most of us would admit up front that it's more difficult to be 100% faithful when we're alone than it is when we are with a group of people who 
sort of hold us <clears throat> accountable. Um, people who are also striving to be faithful, for instance, some of the temptations that you may face during the week are not a temptation when you sit in a church auditorium where most of the people are on the best behavior. Um, but change the setting. Go someplace else. Remove the church crowd. Um, disconnect from your family or your friends. Go somewhere else. Because trying to be faithful and to live obedient for the glory of God in the flesh on our own, when we do that, our faithfulness falters and failure becomes more frequent. So today, I believe the Holy Spirit is calling all of us to faithfulness, to set aside our own flesh, allow the Holy Spirit to develop that fruit of faithfulness in our lives. Now, you're probably familiar with the name Joseph in the New Testament story of Christ coming to this earth. He was married to Mary, the mother of Jesus, so he was Jesus' earthly stepfather. And he was a very faithful, godly man. But we're going to talk about a different Joseph this morning from Genesis chapter 39. Now, you may be pretty familiar with this account. In Genesis 39... Here's some background or some context considering this. There was a man, and his name was Jacob. He had 12 sons, and Joseph was one of the 12, and Joseph was his fa <clears throat> favorite. I mean, it was pretty obvious. And Jacob really didn't make any bones about it. He didn't try to cover it up. Uh, Joseph received some special treatment. He seems to have received more attention. He had nicer clothes. Uh, his brothers resented this and then eventually got so bad they plotted to kill him. <clears throat> but at the last second, were persuaded not to do that. And they threw Joseph into an old dry cistern where he could not climb out of it. And then eventually he was sold <clears throat> to a group of Ishmaelite slave traders who were headed to Egypt. Now, his brothers carried this ruse off by telling their father that Joseph had been killed by wild animals. So Joseph goes from being snatched out of a privileged life and thrust into a life of slavery in a foreign land. I mean, if anyone could be abandoned and alienated and alone, it had to be Joseph. So I'm going to suggest three ways we can imitate Joseph, three different kinds of ways to allow the Holy Spirit to produce faithfulness in, in us. Here's the first, be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in the little things. <clears throat> Let's look at Genesis 39, verse 1 and 2. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. <clears throat> Verse 2 says, The Lord was with Joseph, though he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, if you have a Bible that you can mark and underline that phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. Because on the surface, it surely wouldn't seem like it, does it? I mean, at least from our Western cultural perspective of Christianity, that's not how we expect to be living or treated if we're walking with God. But remember, Jesus promised us in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble, he said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So we're going to have difficulties here because God is more interested in our character development than our comfort. So that tells me that having difficult circumstances is not an excuse to disobey God or to be unfaithful, is it? Rather, difficult times like ones we're in now and our situations today in our country and in our, <clears throat> our state and in our community is certainly not anything like what Joseph had to deal with a number of times. 
But troubling times, trying times, and certain times are opportunities for our faithfulness to shine. Now look at verse 3, Genesis 39, 3. And when the master saw that the Lord was with him, when his master, Potiphar, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. So he finds himself working for Potiphar, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, one of the top dogs. Look at verse 4 through the first part of verse 6. Joseph found favor in his eyes, talking about Potiphar, and became his attendant. And Potiphar then put him in charge of his household, and he trusted his, to his care everything he owned, it says, from the time he put him in the charge of his household and all that he owned. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left Joseph's in Joseph's care, everything he had, with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. So Joseph is living such a godly life, such a life of integrity and faithfulness, that this unbeliever, who did not have a background in, um, you know, the Jewish teachings, trusted. Joseph. He saw something distinctive in his life that was attractive, attractive to him. And Joseph apparently was, was faithful in the everyday details, despite being a slave, despite being far from home, being somewhere he didn't want to be because of a very unpleasant treatment, difficulties. And so we can be faithful too whether we're an employee or employer or retiree or students as a Christian, your employer should sense there's something distinctively different about you. You show up on time. You do the best job that you can for your employer. You, you uh, pay your bills on time. You're honest about the, with the expense account. You promptly return voicemails and emails. You give 100% even when the boss is out of town on vacation. You don't give Satan a foothold. Remember what Jesus taught, Matthew 25, that if we're faithful in little things, small things, we'll be entrusted with, with much. And I think this passage speaks to single people, regardless of age or circumstances for being single, whether you're divorced or widowed or having never been married, I hope that you remember this outline point in the future as you maybe consider marriage down the road or remarriage, look at the potential mate and observe if he or she is faithful in the little things. Are they a person of their word? Does she or he keep their commitments at work or at school? Does he treat his mother with respect? Does he treat his sisters with a certain degree of respect, at least? Has he been respectful of the young ladies he's dated in the past? You strive to marry someone who can be trusted to be faithful in the small things, and generally speaking, the big things are going to naturally fall into place. I shared this past Wednesday night the importance of every little thing. Ever stop to consider how important you are to the success of your church, for example? It's been said that almost all the great successes in life are won by very fine margins. For example, the fastest runner in the world will, is no more than just a few fractions of a second ahead of other competitors. According to George McMillan, a university swimming coach, the fastest swimmer is only separated from the others by a few short inches. A drop in the bucket may not seem too significant. However, it may be very great in the result that it produces. Small pieces of adhesive tape which somehow disappear from the proper position cause a delay in the orbiting of a very expensive satellite. A single piece of stone in a mosaic is indispensable. One little wire doesn't appear to be too important, but when it's disconnected, your very expensive automobile or truck 
can't run. Doesn't take any work. Look at the peacock's tail and remember that tiny bit of matter within the egg from which the, te peepo the peacock grew. A tiny screw in the tail of the wing of an airplane may save a crash. A faulty switch repaired may prevent a fire. A lot of us will remember back in 1986 when the Challenger space shuttle exploded, taking the life of all the astronauts on board. It was all because of one O-ring, one small O-ring that didn't do its job. See, little things are extremely important. Not necessarily because of what they are in themselves, but rather because of what they are a part of depends heavily upon them for success. And we might feel like we're one speck in the universe without much worth or value. We may believe that we can make little or no contribution to the world, others, and God. But that's wrong. Every person, whether single or married, young or old, rich or poor, weak or strong, is absolutely and extremely important. The Bible tells us that Jesus came, went to the cross, and rose from the dead to save us. But would you understand that if the world was just you alone, he still would have done that for you? Every single person has that much worth and value. Because you are extremely important to him. You're incredibly important to God, to Jesus, to his church, to the world that he created. Everything that you are, everything that you do is extremely important to God's church and what he wants to accomplish in the world. So don't ever underestimate your value or importance. We find our worth, our highest self-esteem in God, a relationship with our Creator. He placed you on this earth for His sovereign purposes. He led you to His church for specific purposes, His. And His purposes are not only important, they're also going to prevail. Your role in this world is extremely important, especially as part of His church. If God's church is to accomplish all that He has called her to do, it'll take your contribution, your help. You're strategically important to your church. Your prayers are important. Your giving is important. Your participation and involvement is important. Everything you are, everything you do is extremely important to God. His church and what he wants to accomplish in this world. So the next time you think about skipping out or bowing out of some ministry or activity next time the devil attempts to convince you that you don't have anything to offer or what you have to offer is not a big deal that your time or your talent or your treasure or your resources don't make that much of a significant contribution <clears throat> you remember every little thing is important every little thing makes a big difference don't forget that the Bible tells us in Colossians 317, it says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything we do ought to be done to the glory of God. It's a reflection of our faithfulness. Joseph was faithful in small things, little daily things, the daily duties that he had, so much so that Potiphar was absolutely trusting him. He had no concerns about his day-to-day -day activities. So you be faithful in little things. But secondly, you strive to be faithful in times of temptation. You strive to be faithful in times of temptation. Everything seems to be going well for Joseph. He's going to rebuild his life, even though he's working as a slave. He's highly respected. And then look at Genesis 39, verses 6. And seven, the last part of verse 6 and verse 7. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph. And she said, come to bed with me. Well, that's not very subtle. Uh, this lady makes the ch Lady Gaga look like the church lady. She's on the prowl sexually. And she's going to use her prominence to get what she wants, she thinks. Look at verse 8 and 9. But Joseph refused. 
hey, with me in charge, he told her, my master's not concerning himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one's greater in this house than I am. Master has withheld nothing from me except for you because you're his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now, if there was ever a man who could justify his own thinking, it would be okay to give in to this temptation. It was Joseph. And I bet you that Satan was whispering to him, Oh, come on, Joseph. I mean, no one's ever going to know. And if you don't sleep with her, she can make your life pretty miserable, you know? I mean, think about this, Joseph. Your family's disowned you. You're living in a forward country. You're a slave for crying out loud. How many chances do you think you're going to get like this? And Potiphar, he had his choice of women, and he chose her. She's beautiful. I mean, I commend her good choice, don't you, Joseph? So what's the harm? She wants you. Go ahead and sleep with her. But instantly, Joseph's default button was this. How could I do such a thing and sin against God? Now, that gives us some insight into Joseph's relationship with the Lord God. He doesn't say, how can I do such a wicked thing and sin against my parents? How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against my boss? You know, I'd really be disappointed in myself if I did this. Well, all those are noteworthy good reasons not to give in. Joseph's rationale for purity is the highest reason. He says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You see, we're told in the Bible that ultimately all sin is first and foremost against God. Here in Genesis 39, it sounds a lot like what David would write later on in Psalm 51. After he was confronted by Nathan the prophet of his sin with Bathsheba, Psalm 51 begins, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and what's evil in your sight. Now, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. But first and foremost, his sin was against God. His sin was against Almighty God. So the first thought that runs through Joseph's heart and mind is, that by sinning, it would negatively affect his personal relationship with God. So what's your first response when tempted? <coughs> now, sometimes it's impossible to avoid settings of temptation, but we can try, we can be preemptive in avoiding situations where our faithfulness is going to falter. Dr. Charles Stanley says that when we face temptations from the evil one, we must remember the most important factor is the CMD. The CMD. He says that stands for critical moment of decision. Critical moment of decision. And he points out that the strongest, we are the strongest at the first point of attack. If you don't resist it, you don't stand up strong then, you're less likely to stand up in the future as Satan continues to hit and pound away like a battering ram. So if you don't react in a godly way at that first point of attack, at that critical moment of decision, the odds are that later you'll give in. It's easier for your no later to become a maybe in the course of time. If you don't say no and flee, during that first critical moment of decision. Besides, that will handicap your journey to Christ-likeness in this life. About three years ago or so, I spoke to a man on the telephone who had cheated on his wife and had been discovered, and he was sobbing as he talked to me on the phone, and he said, I actually wrote this down. He said, Steve, everywhere I look in every direction, all I see is the havoc that I've caused because of my poor decisions. You see, if we're led by the Spirit, if, if we're not led by the Spirit, walking in step daily with the Spirit, we can gradually drop our guard and lower our standards. <clears throat> Jeremiah 
gives us a pretty accurate description of our 21st century Western culture when he writes in Jeremiah 6.15, Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush, he says. Paul writes in Romans 3.18, There's no fear of God before their eyes. That's what happens when we don't make the right decision at the critical moment of decision and eventually let things deteriorate. Now, you have to understand that God loves you so much that he's not going to let you get by with your unfaithfulness. If you're not his child, you're a creation of God, but you've not yet made the decision to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you will face judgment someday when this life is over. You can mark it down. If you are his child, you've been born again or adopted into God's family, and yet you're living a life of unfaithfulness, he will discipline you now. Yeah, he will. Hebrews 12, last part of verse 5 and verse 6 says, My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those that he loves. And he punishes everyone that he accepts as, as a son. It's a sign of his love for you, in other words, and his intent, his goal, to mature you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So here's Joseph. Everything is at his disposal, except for one thing, Potiphar's wife. The Bible tells us that he was a hunk. He was well-built. He was handsome. And Mrs. Potiphar is constantly trying to put the moves on him. But look at Genesis 30, 9, 10. And, all, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or to even be with her. And what would you have done? Here's the point. If you're walking with the Lord, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can communicate to you if you listen. It all depends on what you're listening for and who you're listening to. Joseph was all alone, and yet he remained faithful. And when the moment of truth occurred, that CMD arrived, he ran. How paradoxical is it that sometimes the most courageous response for the Christian is to run? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of their pure heart. There is something inside of every believer which enables us to be faithful. And it's not really something, it's someone. It's the Holy Spirit. And His power living inside us, the power of Jesus Christ, allows us and enables us and equips us to conquer sin. Otherwise, we'd be pretty much all powerless. We'd be working out of the flesh instead of in the spirit. And if you're a Christian, it's not a matter of you getting more and more of the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of the Holy Spirit controlling more and more of you as you mature in Christ's likeness walking in the Spirit as you surrender yourself anew every day. Listen to Ephesians 1, verse 18 and following. Ephesians 1, verse 18 and following. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you, He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people, and His incomparable great power towards us who believe. That power is the same as his mighty strength, as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and sealed him, seated him at the right hand, at his right hand in the heavenly realms. He can do more than you can dream of through you because the power that brought Jesus back from the grave is alive in you. And you can live a holy life, a life of faithfulness. See, it's not by might but by my power, by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by might, it's not by earthly power, human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, Zechariah 4.6.
I like the way that Earl Nightingale said it. He said, you'll remain the same until the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of change. And he's right. Oftentimes we don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. Second Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow produces repentance. It leads to salvation. It leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So you be faithful in your little things. You be faithful in times of temptation. And then thirdly, be faithful. Strive to be faithful when treated unfairly. You be faithful when things don't go your way. Listen, read along with me what happens in Genesis 39. One day he, Joseph, went to the house to attend to his duties. And now the household servants were inside. And Potiphar's wife caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he'd left his cloak behind in her hand, ran out of the house, she called to her household servants, Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak behind and ran out of the house. She kept her cloak beside her until the master came home. Then she told Potiphar this story, this Hebrew slave you brought came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. So she cries rape in order to cover the tracks of her own illicit intent. Potiphar throws Joseph into prison where he'd be for some time. I mean, how unfair is all that? And yet when he was treated unfairly, put in prison for doing nothing wrong, Joseph still maintained his faithfulness to God. Look at Genesis 39, verse 20, last part of verse 20 to 23. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor now as the prison warden. And the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The Lord paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So he was in very difficult circumstances, and yet he was faithful, and the Lord worked through his faithfulness. He's given more and more responsibilities there. Why? Because he stayed faithful. He remained faithful to God. So how do you respond when you're treated unfairly? When life gives you lemons, do you make lemonade or do you complain? Do you question God and shake your angry fist at him? Why have you let me down like this, God, after all I've done for you? You see, being mistreated happens to all of us routinely. But can I say something? In the coming years, that mistreatment is probably going to radically increase for the Christian community. So you need to realize that that's coming, prepare for that, and toughen up. There are constant reminders that we need to realize that when it comes to religious freedom, the playing field is no longer level. The name of Jesus Christ is very offensive to others. The Bible tells us that it would be. And Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The claims of Christianity are exclusive. He's the only way to life eternal. And what's unique and telling is that other names are not a flaming reminder of to the culture that we live in, but the name of Jesus Christ is. You mentioned his name. That's referred to as imposing your values on someone else. Now, if you don't understand that, go back and study our nation's history and the stand that our founding fathers, many other leaders through the years have taken. Even FDR, I made the comment in my July 5th sermon, that even FDR, who was not a particularly religious person, as D-Day was being launched, he prayed over the radio, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you might think, well, yeah, that was, you know, America was a lot different then, and how right you are. That's why it's so critical, my friends, in these days that we step it up a lot in our prayer lives, our prayer game. Too much is at stake. So much is at stake. 
but society will continue to systematically try to muzzle the mouth of believers. Say anything you want to, just leave out Jesus, leave out God. Does it make any difference if somebody well known like Tiger Woods here a few years ago in a Masters golf tournament made a bad putt or drive and, and screamed out the name of Jesus Christ in vain and no one was critical about that. But don't you find it rather strange that when you whack your thumb with a hammer, you're not tempted to say, oh, Mohammed? Or your stroke will get caught off cut off in traffic or something, you don't, the first thing you say is not, Julius Caesar, can you believe that happened? Why then do people say the name of Jesus Christ? Even through careless, casual swearing and anger, it's an indication that Jesus truly is who he claims to be. So you expect opposition and you know that it's coming. And when you're treated unfairly, it's tough to handle, but you make certain you know that that's going to happen. And although you may feel at times like you're in a vast minority, would you understand as a believer in Jesus, as a follower of Christ, you're never all alone? Because the Holy Spirit lives within you, and he empowers you so you can trust God. You can trust his timing. You can trust his will to be done. Although things right at the in your current situation may seem unfair. Because of his faithfulness, Joseph was eventually released from prison, was elevated to second in command of all of Egypt to Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians. He leapfrogged over Potiphar. He kind of became like vice president and Secretary of Agriculture at the same time upon his release from prison. See, Joseph had to wait a number of years before discovering the why. God was allowing him to go through some difficult times, some hardships. And for you and me, we may not understand all of God's workings until eternity, when all wrongs are made right. But it doesn't matter. You allow the Holy Spirit to develop a deeper level of faithfulness through it all. Always. Anyway, Christian author and speaker Steve Ferrar tells that back in the 1950s, the American people <clears throat> knew there was three kind of prominent names of talented, compelling speakers that kind of stood out. There were two of those names that would always pop up on the list of those three. These compelling evangelical speakers, preachers. But over time, two of the three essentially backslid away from the Lord. One actually committed suicide. The other became entrapped and enslaved to drugs and alcohol. But the third, the third has a freeway named after him in North Carolina because people saw his integrity, his faithfulness, consistency through the decades and, of course, I'm talking about Billy Graham. See, over time, a person's true colors have a way of, of shining through. A man's message will always be heard in regard, in context to his character. So remember, with the help of the Holy Spirit, the finish line is much closer than you think. And God wants you to grow in faithfulness because that is his nature to be faithful and he wants you to be like him. That's who he is. That's who he wants you to become. He will always be faithful even if you are faithless. God wants you to be faithful in response to his example of faithfulness to show your love for him through your obedient lifestyle. Listen to these three promises that talk to us about God's faithfulness. Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 9, God who called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. God is faithful. 1 John 1 verse 9, 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. God is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your amazing love. We thank you for the living hope that we have in Jesus and in Jesus alone. May that hope alone inspire us, motivate us to love you and obey you. To know you have our best interest at heart always. And the best way to live is your way, by far. Help us to understand that. Help us to live that out for the sake of those around us who don't have that hope yet. The hope that comes even and only in Jesus. And I pray in his name. Amen.